very happy to be here. Um, and I want to talk today about rumor and uh, as political communication in, in modern Iran. And I, I want to stress from the outset uh, that I'm only in the preliminary stages of researching this particular subject. Um, and the talk today will largely consist of stage setting um, and running through some early hypotheses. Uh, so more, more detailed conclusions will have to wait until I actually get some funding to be able to carry out the research I need to do. Um, but um, uh, for the time being, I'll, I'll give you some of uh, my ideas about how rumor works in modern Iranian politics. Uh, can I, uh, first of all, can everyone hear me? Or is it, am I coming through loud and clear? Right. Um, <clears throat> so I see this project as an extension of my broader study of the ways in which the Iranian media, uh, uh, excuse me, the Iranian masses have engaged with national life over the past century, with the modern means of mass communication playing a central role in this engagement. Uh, my previous work has focused on the cinema, and particularly the Pat Laviera popular cinema. Um, and I've argued against standard interpretations of that era's films as meaningless and derivative entertainment, targeted largely at a working class, unsophisticated audience uh, that's living on the margins of a modernizing society. Uh, I've, I've argued that, in fact, those behind the production of these films were largely educated middle-class folks um, who perhaps had the most at stake in Iran's modernization. Uh, and the film narratives were often grounded in uh, middle-class ideas of the family that took to task aspects of that national uh, development, uh, of the national development projects of the time. And in fact, one might argue that the cinematic commentary uh, on Pahlavi elite's national priorities uh, in part constituted the very entertainment of the films of the time. Um, however, cinema hasn't been the only venue through which ordinary Iranians have engaged with modern Iranian politics. Um, in fact, I would argue that uh, rumor has been a vital point of communication between elites uh, and masses uh, in modern Iran. And of course, it's difficult to talk about the role of rumor in Iranian politics and society without mention of the mass media, since it's only through the wide transmission of these rumors that they come to have an effect on the world. Um, <clears throat> I want to briefly go over the organization of the talk. So I will start by talking about what drew me to this subject itself, the 2009 post-election uh, crisis in Iran, where the rumor mill was crucial to both the mobilization of mass protest and the reporting on the protests themselves. Uh, I will then touch on the problems encountered in studying rumor in modern Iran. Uh, the main issue is the lack of writing on the subject, whether historical or theoretical. Uh, and this would seem to be partly due uh, to the general association of rumor with pre-modern political culture. With the advent of print and later with the electronic media, it was understood that the masses now had access to definitive information from authoritative sources. It was perhaps assumed that the rumor mill and its distortions of reality would dry up in the face of professional journalism uh, and on the scene reports via radio, television, uh, newsreel, and now obviously the, the internet. Yet rarely has the promise of a free press been realized, especially in Iran and other de developing countries. Tight state control and censorship has characterized the mass media uh, since their beginnings. Uh, Western development experts, for their part, uh, actively endorsed this situation by arguing that the incipient masses in Iran and elsewhere were not ready for an unfettered media environment. But if the state media uh, were intended to mobilize the masses for national projects uh, 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 of, the, of the political elites, then the rumor mill has often operated to mobilize the masses against these particular projects. So I will highlight some recent examples of rumor as political communication in Iranian history. 
and the role of the mass media in this communication, looking in particular at the Islamic Revolution of 1978 and 79, and the 2009 post-election crisis. Uh, I will then wrap up uh, things by showing you a rather explicit discussion of the workings of rumor in Iran in scenes from a relatively recent feature film uh, investigating the death of the Pahlavi era wrestling champion, Ghulam Reza Tahdi, uh, with the circumstances of his death itself uh, generating much debate uh, over the years. Well, the, the lively debate um, among journalists and academics in the West about the revolutionary potential of the internet in Iran during the 2009 post-election crisis uh, first drew me to, uh, 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 to the subject of rumor in modern uh, Iranian political history. And there was at the time uh, much giddy commentary about how the social media in particular had not only broken uh, the state monopoly on information, but also organized the demonstrators in, in, in their efforts to overturn the election results and even the political system itself. Uh, skeptics of this Twitter revolution pointed to bandwidth limitations, content filters, uh, and the lack of uniform access to the internet in, in Iran in response to this excitement about the subversive power of the media. However, little was said on either side of the debate about the character of the online content. The YouTube clips, uh, the Twitter feeds, uh, and blog testimonials that the crisis prompted were frequently anonymous and unconfirmed, and as such worked as rumor. The online activism of the demonstrators in Iran and of expatriates abroad did not necessarily represent a new kind of mass political action. Rather, these internet contributions were more an extension of existing popular practices of political communication and mobilization in Iran. The place of rumor in political and social history has received very little attention in the scholarship on modern Iran or on the wider Middle East, uh, <clears throat> for that matter. However, with regard to South Asia, the influential subaltern studies scholar Ranajit Guha has written on rumor uh, in anti-colonial rebellions in India during the 19th and early 20th centuries. In fact, he's argued that the transmission of rumor is both a universal and necessary aspect of insurgency in pre-industrial and pre-literate societies. According to Goha, uh, rumors were spread in India most prominently via interpersonal communication. For example, messages circulated in the bazaar or by courier from village to village. Here's a <clears throat> sketch of a, of a chokedar or a night watchman who, who was charged with relaying these particular messages. <clears throat> I wonder if you can define a rumor. Like in your context? Well, it's, I would say it's anonymous and unattributed uh, information, news and information. Okay. Thanks. I'm, I'm not sure why the, the bottom of it is being cut off, but uh, these, these folks were charged <coughs> with relaying messages uh, from village to village, messages of import from village to village. Um, the relating of rumors from person to person could also take nonverbal and symbolic forms through text, music, plant and animal parts, and even chapatis. Uh, the anonymity and ambiguity of many such messages allowed for improvisation in their transmission and reception. Uh, consequently, well-disseminated rumors could be aligned with a number of pre-existing and often conf conflicting uh, ideological patterns affecting rather disparate groups uh, and unifying them behind a particular political cause, such as mass revolt against the British Raj. Rumors gain the significance of truth not only by insinuating themselves with existing beliefs uh, about social and political conditions, but often in conjunction with widespread expectations of miraculous intervention. And so the classic example of rumor that Guha uh, uh, gives as political mobilization is from the 1857 mutiny against the British Raj, when multiple fears of ritual pollution reportedly rallied the public uh, against the colonial authority. 
and British officials had assumed a conspiracy of indigenous elites to be responsible uh, for the rumors and the seemingly spontaneous revolts that were taking place across India. Guha counters that it was widespread disaffection with colonial rule that encouraged belief in the rumors about the British defilement of the native population. And this belief would combine, or gain, uh, combine with or gain strength from other, often otherworldly, beliefs of imminent liberation to promote mass action. The example that Goha gives seemingly backs his assertion that rumor was a particular condition of political life in pre-modern societies. In other words, it thrived in a climate that predated the emergence of national ideologies, of mass political organization with the mass media being vital to these phenomena, <coughs> and one in which fear and fatalism pervaded the population. But this view assumes that modern political culture is always free and inclusive, that news and information on the world is simply out there waiting to be reported rather than something to be made. It also implicitly stresses the facility of the audiovisual media to automatically capture and reproduce the truth of events. But what about questions of perspective and objectivity? Can we claim that all news considered to be of national relevance is first freely accessible, and second, free of all distortion? In Iran, where uh, authoritarian political systems have prevailed since before the Second World War, and where mass political action uh, has been largely suppressed, many would argue that information control and media manipulation has been the rule rather than the exception. Consequently, members of the Iranian public have to a greater or lesser extent depended on gossip and rumor for stories of local and national concern too sensitive or too full of holes to print or broadcast. Popular belief in rumors has often been correlated with doubt in the existing political system. So just as in colonial India, the rumor mill in modern Iran, uh, primarily traveling by word of mouth, has ensured that there is no monopoly on the representation of events. Of course, the rumor mill originating in government offices, in private parties, in taxi cabs, in corner shops, and now through the social media, um, can engage in falsehood, can engage in misinformation and distortion in much the same way as the state media. And the diffuse nature of rumor mongering also ensures that the modern security apparatus of the state can never entirely silence its sources. As Gohan notes, it was the diffuse character of rumor that made it an effective language of revolt in colonial India. And we can say much the same for rumor in modern Iran. Perhaps the most prominent example of how rumor galvanized the opposition movement during the Islamic Revolution involves the deadly 1978 fire at the Cinema Rex in Abadan, which cost more than 400 audience members uh, their lives. And before the fire, Abadan was, first of all, at the center of the Iranian oil industry and had remained relatively peaceful compared to other Iranian cities. And after the fire, rumors quickly spread uh, that placed blame on the tragedy on agents of the Shah, uh, who had sought to dis discredit the Islamist wing of the revolutionary movement through the fire. Although most scholars now believe that the responsible party was in fact a group of radical uh, Islamists who set the fire uh, to turn the local population against the Shah. Uh, and interestingly, widespread belief in the rumors of government complicity uh, encouraged investigators at the time to cover up the involvement of local and, and national religious leaders uh, in the arson for fear of feeding into the existing rumors. So by then, uh, unfortunately, the, the rumors of the regime's involvement had already done uh, their damage, uh, and many commentators uh, have pointed to the Cinema Rex fire as the event that irreversibly placed Iran on the path to revolution. Likewise, rumors and ideas of otherworldly salvation uh, also come together in this Iranian revolutionary movement, just as they did in the 1857 mutiny, uh, uh, as, as Goha uh, describes it. Uh, much of Ayatollah Khomeini's personal charisma was derived from the millenarian sentiments that he and his closest supporters encouraged among the Iranian masses. 
And so Shiite prophecies related to the end of times were eagerly connected to Khomeini's life story uh, by his supporters. And in late 1978, there was even a rumor that Khomeini's face could be seen on the, room, on, on the surface of the moon. And this story spread through bazaar and mosque networks, through surrogate national radio services like BBC Persian, as well as uh, in gatherings of family and friends, linked up with some end of times prophecies which have claimed the appearance of the face of the Mahdi or the Muslim Redeemer uh, on the surface of the moon as one of the signs of the apocalypse. Uh, one major point of difference between my analysis of rumor in modern Iran and Goha's account of the rumor mill in colonial India is that I'm contending that rumors are not merely the province of the so-called irrational and fear-bound crowd. In fact, rumors in Iran uh, have performed uh, their most important function as a means of communication between elites and masses. Articles from officially sanctioned newspapers and state television reports have often included oblique references to rumors in general circulation with the aim of clarifying, dismissing, or redirecting those rumors. And new, these news stories often assume public knowledge of uh, the rumor mill, uh, which can sometimes make the content of the newspapers in Iran appear to those outside of the loop as an indecipherable code. And one complaint that many students of Persian often have is the difficulty of reading newspapers. Uh, and from my perspective, this is again due more to content than it is to language. Um, <clears throat> one recent important example of an official media response to the unofficial rumor mill active among the general public concerned the death of Neda Agha Sultan uh, during the mass protests that followed the disputed 2009 elections. The rumor mill, via social media, uh, but especially via satellite television, quickly spread the news uh, of her death inside Iran and soon thereafter broadcast the identity of her purported killer, uh, <clears throat> whose ID had been captured by some bystanders, bystanders uh, in the protest. Word of her killing and the belief of uh, government complicity in her killing contributed to a change in the character of the street demonstrations uh, from protesting the election results to protesting the very nature of the political system. Um, political elites in response via the state media would then set out to question the credibility of these foreign-based rumor mongers gossiping about uh, her death by stirring up rumors of their own. One particularly stunning accusation in this regard was that the BBC's Tehran correspondent John Lane had with British intelligence agents organized the murder of Ms. Agha uh, Sultan to spice up a documentary that they were making uh, about the protests. Similarly, uh, during the Islamic Revolution court, elites uh, engaged in rumor mongering to discredit Ayatollah Khomeini and other opposition leaders. A particularly inflammatory article appeared in the official newspaper Etilat in early January of 1978 that claimed for Khomeini Indian descent and in this way attempted to smear him as a British imperialist plant. And doctored pictures uh, shortly thereafter uh, circulated of Khomeini without a beard and wearing a suit uh, which aroused more uh, derision uh, and satire rather than belief. This, this picture was published in a, uh, an exile uh, publication in, uh, in Paris in 1981. Um, <clears throat> so political elites may also address other elites through rumors floated in state-sanctioned media outlets as well as through unofficial channel channels. So the newspaper columns, web entries, and sound bites of politicians concerning drafts of a never formally announced or acknowledged national unity plan in the fall of 2009 are a good example of the role of the rumor mill in intra-elite politics. The talk among some government officials of a deviant current infecting Ahmadinejad's uh, inner circle is another example of elite rumor mongering. These examples may also be linked historically to the role of rumor in courtly intrigues uh, that, that often plagued pre-modern Iran and the wider Persianate world. We can see here that rumor as political communication was thus not solely 
the province of the lower orders, even in the pre-modern era. I want to stress, though, that the operation of rumor in modern Iran is not simply the residue of timeless tradition. It is a historical practice that has been reconfigured for an increasingly educated public seeking to assert itself in national affairs, which in turn has prompted political elites to engage in rumor with the aim of either mobilizing or deactivating that public. In fact, the very idea of the rumor mill as a remnant of pre-modern political culture now only of relevance to stagnant and underdeveloped societies like Iran would seem to be a fallacy. In the post-industrialized nations of the modern West, rumors operate in the political realm often in the same way as they do in Iran. So, For example, the persistent rumors about Barack Obama's Muslim faith or birth outside of the United States are perhaps the best example of such rumor mongering. The new and democratic mass medium of the internet has only amplified the efficacy of such political communication. And the 24-hour news cycle has also prompted serious journalists to look to the social media for their uh, leads and sources. Likewise, unattributed speech has had real effects on economic conditions in our rapidly globalizing and rationalizing world, which can in turn have political effects. So a leak about a company's quarterly earnings or a central bank's policy changes, whether true or false, can by itself result in the withdrawal and transfer of enormous sums of capital and even the collapse of governments. And of course, most of what we call intelligence is also rumor. In fact, we often talk about it as chatter. Uh, one might <laughs> conclude that an understanding of the workings of rumor is necessary to an understanding of politics, media, and public life in any modern society. I want to end this talk by showing a, flu a few clips uh, from a 1997 film that sets out to depict uh, how rumors are spread and deciphered uh, in Iran. And this film is entitled Jahan Pahlavan Tahti, or Tahti World Champion. And it's about Olam Reza Tahti, uh, who was a world champion wrestler and national hero uh, during the 1950s and 1960s, who died under rather mysterious circumstances in a Tehran hotel uh, in 1968. And while his death was officially ruled a suicide, rumors of his murder quickly. Uh, uh, circulated, with most attributing responsibility uh, to the Shah's secret police. Ali Hatami uh, had written the initial script for this film, uh, but died during its production. Um, <clears throat> the finished project, pro uh, product makes use of uh, Hatami's footage, but the narrative is primarily uh, about how the director who succeeds Hatami on the project attempts to complete the film. Uh, the major problem that this new director faces is that Hatami's final script has gone missing. And so we follow the new director in his quest to track down the missing script, as well as to better understand the circumstances behind Tahti's death. And the director first turns uh, to his own social circle to find out what they might know, or more accurately, what their opinion is of the various rumors out there about Tahti. And so, in an early scene, uh, the director's uncle, uh, to, to, to his right, uh, comes to dinner. And after dinner, they have a discussion about uh, Tahti's death. این همون سیگه که معروفه شد که میگفتن آهنو خم میکنه باید یه مروری بکنی روی تاریخ کشتی بنو بله داستان پوریای ولی و معرفت و جوان مردی اتفاقا تاریخ کشتی پهلوانی زیاد هم تاریخ معرفت و جوان مردی نیست عجب اقابی بود الان از تختی فقط یکی بوده اما شب و بیمخ بیشتر داشتیم پوریای ولی شاید افسانه باشه 
اما پهلوان اکبر خراسانی واقعا وجود داشته اکبر خراسانی در دوران ناصر الدین شاه سالهای سال پهلوان اول ایران بود وقت کشته گرفتن سعی میکرد حریفش رو ناقص الوز بکنه پهلوان کاظم کاشی رو چنان معیوبش کرد که تو راه برگشته به کاشون از بین رفت مرد پهلوان حسین کلپز و پهلوان حسین گلزار هر دوتا قبل از کشتی مسموم شدند پهلوان جفر قوم یه دفعه حریف شده بود تو راه امامزاده داوود پرتش کردن توی دره و یه چند روزی خوراک کلاقا و اولاش خورا بود قشنگه مگه نه؟ من شک ندارم که خیلی ها دوست داشتن تختی رو تو تابوت ببیننش قضیه داره تاب برمیداره من هنوز جوونم حواست باشه خیلی از اونایی که دوست داشتن زیر تابوت تختی اکس یادگاری بگیرن هنوز زندن شوری که پیروزی تختی در دل دوستداران ورزش برانگیخت پیوند پهلوان با مردم را ناگسستنی کرد Okay, so I mean, obviously, in this in this particular scene, his uncle turns to history uh, to support his theory that Tahdi was murdered, likely at the hands of his sporting or political rivals. Uh, <clears throat> the director ne next turns to uh, a newspaper man for information, uh, and this, so we have a meeting in a in a in a newspaper office with the editor in chief. بسیارشون عکس گرفتم بریم سر اصل مطلب چی میخوای راجع به تختی بدونی؟ راستش بیشتر میخوایم راجع به مرگش بدونیم اینکه خودکشی بوده اینقدر خب شاید هم قطع بوده میدونی خیلی از آدم های مشهور یه جوری میبینن که تا عبد ملت رو میزنن سر کار نمونهش همین شازده خانم داینا الان ملت مصر میگن که به قطر رسیده خب اینکه قرار بوده با یه مرد عرب ازدواج کنه و بچه های پرنس چارز خار بردره مسلمان عرب پیدا میکرده بنابراین سرویس مخفی ملکی رو که حالای خانم میکنی بسنگی اینگه خیال بافی هم اگه نه؟ بسش خانم من نمیدونم ولی امروزه همه چی پیشرفت کرده و تکنیک سهنسازی آدم کشی هم خیلی پیچیده شده به حال موضوع خیلی حساسی میدونی مرمون تختی قبل از مرگش هم برای مردم خب اگه چه قاب میکردن رو تاخشای خونشو میذاشتن نمیدونم برای شعر میگفتن شعار میساختن و حالا فرض محال فکر کنین که به این برسیم که خودکشی کرد این چه جوری میخوام به مردم بگیم اوکی سو اگر میکن سید که این قویست برای انفرمیشن از آسان تاکن پلیس از دیگر تایم از پرنسس دیانه دیت which obviously generated its own rumor mill. Uh, this scene also points to the problems of censorship uh, that the officially sanctioned media faces in Iran. The information that the director wants uh, is not to be found in the newspapers. Uh, in a later scene, the director's wife is researching all these old newspapers from the time of Tahdi's death uh, for clues. And her husband tells her not to bother because the truth has been censored out. Uh, but that's not to say that newspaper men don't know uh, or don't have theories about what happened, even if they don't report it themselves. And uh, this is the reason why he uh, goes to see the newspaper to find out, uh, the newspaper man to find out what he might know. Um, okay, well, and of course, when, when the director turns to interviewing people who knew Tahdi personally uh, <clears throat> about his death, then their views tell, them, tell him more about their own personal uh, politics. But this also points to how rumors about an event can come into conflict uh, and how these differing viewpoints are also uh, more interested in advancing a particular political goal uh, than uh, getting at the truth of things. 
Uh, and there's a long sequence uh, in the middle of the film that, uh, invo that is basically him going from home to home, visiting with some of these uh, uh, acquaintances of Tahti and, and hearing about what they thought uh, happened to him. And we'll watch a few of these uh, here. باور کرد مردی که یه پسر بچه سه چهار ماهه توی خونه چش براشه واسه مرافع بازنش بره خودشو بکشه اونم تختی آدمی که همه میدونستن مؤمن نماز و روزش قطع نمیشه نماز خونم بود پس چی یه مهر کوچیک و یه جامهری تمیز همیشه همراهش بود وقت تمرینم همیشه حوله خودشو با خودش می آورد نه مثل بعضیا که نجسی و پاکی سرشون نمیشه البته هوادار جبهه ملی هم بود اما اون زمان آیت الله طالقانی هم جبهه ملی بود آیت الله زنجانی هم بود مهندس بازرگان هم بود از سال 41 و 42 مخصوصا بعد از 15 خرداد شد که اینا حساب خودشون از جبهه ملی جدا کردن من حساب خودمو میزنم هر چه بخواد بشه تختی رو تو دریا بزرگش کردم اگر نه خودش کشتگیر معمولی بود موحد خیلی بیشتر از تختی مداله بود تو دریا بزرگش کردن یا مصدقیا توده یا مصدقی ها سرپای کلوسان آقا جون حزب توده همه این داره دست رای داره میکرد مصدق هم خودش رو احمد آباد زندانی بود اختیاری نداشت امثال تیمور وقتی ها به اسم مصدق هر کاری که دلشون میخواستن میکردن تیمور وقتی یا شاپور وقتی ها گفتم تیمور ببخشی شاپور وقتی ها آقا همه شون سرپای کلوسان بله تختی آدم ضعیف بود با زنش دوا کرد رفت تو خوش سر به نیست کرد. این قضیه هم هیچ ربطی به سیاست نداشت. منتهاش تو دریا اومدن سیاسیش کردن. آقای جلال آل احمد دارو دسته چو انداخته بودن که کار ساباک بود. شا دست بوده. قربون شما برم. تختی محبوب شا بود. البته شما نمیتونید همه حقایق رو بنویسید. الان قلم در کف دشمنه. آقا خواهش میکنم. یادم میاد یه روز جمعه با تختی میرفتیم کو. تو همین خیابون دربند. میرفتیم سر بالا. یه کاربر ماشین دربایی داشتن رد میشدن. زدن رو ترمز خودش ها پیاده شد با تختی سلام و احوال پرسی کرد گفت چیزی کم نداری اوزاد خوبه اینجوری آدم مغرور بود خدا بیاموز اصلا جا نخورد حالا اینو داشته باشیم شاه سوار شد کاروان حرکت کرد تختی هم از اون طرف من نگاه کردم پشت سرم دیدم شاه همینجوری که داره میره از شیشه عقب ماشین داره تختی نگاه میکنه و میره آخه دوستش داشت همون خدا بیاموز رو دوست داشتم چه جوری میگن یارو مهر مار داره اونجوری Okay, so I mean, you can see we get multiple perspectives there, multiple uh, political, uh, uh, um, from across the political spectrum, basically. Um, from royalists to religious conservatives. Um, well, during much of the second half of this particular film, um, we find the director largely on the phone, uh, talking with an anonymous informant who claims to have been in the room when Tahti died. And I, I want to show the penultimate scene of the film where he has a long conversation with this informant who finally gives him the details of, of what, uh, what happened according to him. Hello. Hello. آره میدونستم خوابت میبره روش حساب کرده بودم کاش که بیدارم نمیکردی داشتم یه خواب خوب میدیدم یه yeah, پای ات اکسپلین سو هی هاز هم سورت اف واندر اراوند تاون فور آورز اند آورز ویت دس ویت دس درایور اند دن از دراپت آف این دس هوتل روم آل ویت دی ویت دی اینتنت اف هایدینگ دی ایدنتیتی اف دی انفورمنت هم سلف فروم دی دیرکتر اند he falls asleep in the room and then finally he gets a call from 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 this informant. Chatu otagate, jelo dar. Bazish kon. Hello. قبلا دیدمش یادداشت های خودکشی تختی اما با خط من نوشته شده راست میگی خط خودته 
آره اما من ننوشتم اگه خیال خودکشی داشتم همین رو میذاشتم بالای سرم اما خیالشون ندارم تو برای اینکه منو توی تابوت ببینی باید خودت دست به کار بشی بله بون از من آدم کشی بر نمیاد جوان من یه پیر مرد ترسو هم الان سی ساله که با ترس و لحظ شبم و صبح میکنم یاد داشتای خودکشی تختی رو تو نوشتی؟ آره اما به زور با تهدید اسلحه چرا اسلحه؟ مگه حقوق نمیگرفتی؟ بابا من سابای چی نبودم عریضه نویس بودم جلی در دادگستری می شستم عریضه و عرضه حال می نوشتم بعضی ها می دونستن که تقدید خط و جهل این امزام بردم اگه پول خوب می دادن یه طوری جهل می کردم که خط شناسایی دادگستری رو گول می زد یه روز جوانی اومد سراغم که به شست چرب داد ورم داشت بود یه جایی که نفهم می کجا بود هر بود بالای شهر بود طرف های شمرون بود چشمات هم برست؟ نه فقط گفت سرم زرم داشت بود. دو روز توی خونه مجلل تمرین خط تختی رو میکردم پسر گفت کار تمیز میخواد روز سوم که دیگه همه دست خطا رو عین خودش مینوشتم سرمشقای بسی رو روزش جلو فهمیدم خیال دارم پهلمون رو بکشن گفتم نمینویسم یه کشیده که خوردم حاله میشد قضیه شوخی بردار نیست نوشتم ولی بعد نوشتم یه جوری نوشتم که لو بره اما لو نرفت لو نرفت تو روز نامه چاپ بش کردن اما هیچکی درست نگاه نکرد هیچکی بلد نبود درست بخونه کاره تمیزه پیره من بود وقتی هم بعد مینویسی فقط خودت میفهمی بعد اینکه نوشتم یه روز یه همونجا زندانی بودم روز پنجم صبح زود کنار یه خیابون ولم کردم زور نشده بود شنیدم تختی رو بردم پسیش کانونی رفتم خیلی شروع بود وقتی بردنش ابن بابین دیدنش تو قصال خونه گفتم آقا تختی غلط کردم آقا تختی کاش مرد بودم و به جایی دو روز سنگ میخوابیدم سی سال تختی مرده اما من زندم هر سال از دایی یه قدم جلا میاد و میسته تو چشام نگاه میکنه تا سال دیگه میدونه راه فرار ندارم جرات خودکشی ندارم با هم مشکرده بازی میکنه وقتی فهمیدم فیلم تختی رو میخوام بسازم تلفن زدم به آبا حاتمی همه چی رو گفتم باور نکرد گفت سه میلیومت میدم بیای پیش خودم امتحان خط پس بدی تا باور کنم گفتم آقا من از سوهی خودم هم میترسم اونایی که تختیر کشتن اگه بوه برم داره کار به جایی باریک بکشم یا سرم و زیر آب میکنن گفت کجا بدونم خود تو عجیر نکرده واسه من پشت تلفن فیلم بازی کنی وقتی تو کارگردان شدی یه جورایی چند تا از دست خط تو فیده کردم از روش مرش کردم تو ببینی دروغ نمیگم از کجا بدونم دروغ نمیگی خب یکی دست خط من رو جهل کرده خوب هم جهل کرده اما از کجا معلوم تو باشی چی داری میگی؟ دارم میگم شاید یه نفر تو رو اجیر کرده که پای تلفن خوب گریه کنی یه نفر دیگر هم اجیر کرده که خوب خط میریمیسه به یه نفر دیگه هم پول داده که من از قبرستون بیاره اینجا اون که تو رو آورد پسر خودمه نفر سوم هم نداریم دیگه به من زنی نزن پیر مرد من تو چی هستی؟ آخه چرا باید کسی آدم عجیل کنه واسه گول زدن تو؟ برای که من میخوام فیلمشو بسازم اگه فیلمش خوب در بیاد خیلی عمر میکنه نمیشه کشتش نه خودشو میکشه شاید یه نفر میخواد من باورم بشه که قاتلای تختی هنوز زنده هن سر حالن و من باید ازشون حساب ببرم شاید یه پیرمرد پیزوری یه گوشه نشسته نقشه میکشه که فیلم خودشو بسازه مرحوم آتمی راست میگفت من حاضرم بهت پول بدم تا ببینمت که وسیعت نامه تختی رو با خط خودش داری می نویسی اگه جورتش رو نداری دیگه زنی نزن okay, well, um, <clears throat> I think these 
this, this particular scene makes a, a larger point, and the second half of the film makes a larger point about the role of communications technologies in the spread of rumor. Uh, while commentators, for example, have focused on the internet uh, in order to endorse or to deny uh, uh, its role in the most recent uh, uh, political protests in Iran after the presidential elections in 2009, they've often left out another far more important and basic form of communication in organizing mass protest, and that's interpersonal communication. And digital media matters to interpersonal communication too, but it's the cell phone and it's text messaging that plays a dominant role here. Uh, rumors may be anonymous and untraceable, but in order to get others to believe them, we need trusted and familiar voices communicating. I think that's where the phone is particularly important. And I think here, too, we see uh, he doesn't believe him because he doesn't know him, in a sense. The, the rumor is not enough. Uh, there needs to be some uh, familiarity behind it in order for there to be belief in it. Well, I, I thank you very much. I don't know very much about it. Um, what was the wrestler's, was, did he have a political position that would cause people to think someone wanted to murder him? I can understand his competitors, but... Yeah, I, I mean, it's complicated. Uh, he never had any formal political position, but wrestlers historically have always been uh, sort of national heroes. Uh, champion wrestlers have always been sort of national heroes. Uh, because of their um, uh, connection with historical ideas of masculine virtue in Iran. Uh, masculine virtue in Iran. And part of masculine virtue is a sort of public spiritedness. You look out for others. That You are, in a sense, the champion of all peoples, and especially of the weak. And so Tahti was especially known for reaching out to uh, the poor, uh, and the weak in society and helping them out, help, uh, using his fame in a sense to help them out. And so in this way, he sort of gains a political role. And of course, uh, as, the, as some of the earlier clips make clear, there were uh, political elites that tried very hard to also take advantage of him and his popularity uh, to further their own political uh, ambitions in a sense, whether it was the Shah or it was the, the uh, liberal nationalists uh, and Mossadegh, or the communist Tudeh party. Uh, but there were many who, uh, in a sense, are uh, accused of, uh, or uh, thought to uh, make use of or try to manipulate Tahti uh, as a political symbol of their own. Yes? So are you, are you saying that modern, like, Rumor in modern Iran is a function of, is more a function of the state of journalism and um, the political situation there now. Are you saying that this is the outcropping of like a long kind of historical, particularly Persian form of communication? I, not getting the cause and right. like. Yeah, I, mean, I think I would I would say that uh, it's it's the media situation in a sense that has forced. Iranians to look to the historical past for solutions, in a sense, to this particular media situation. Um, and uh, I think rumor is all, the rumor mill has always been important to mass uh, uh, mobilization in Iran in pre-modern times and in, and in modern times. Um, uh, but uh, my point being that uh, Yes, I mean, current conditions uh, are a major reason why rumor is, is so important. Uh, but the way that rumor spreads and the way that people uh, think about rumor has also historical roots, too, I think, in Iran. But certainly, uh, as I'm also claiming, uh, you find rumor everywhere, too. I mean, this is not something even unique to, a, uh, uh, to places in which we have um, a sort of closed media system or a closed media environment or a closed political system. Even in so-called free societies, we also have the work, uh, the operation of rumor in everyday life. 
you talk more about the elite to elite rumor mill and their various media, like, I don't know, sponsors, I guess, or right. like the relationship that they have with certain government sponsored right. outlets right. and how that functions. Well, I mean, I think that it's become more complicated in a sense in recent, in recent decades because uh, most political elites in, uh, now have their own website. Uh, and sometimes uh, 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 their own news agency through which they can broadcast their particular opinions and ideas and broadcast their own rumors uh, through those particular websites. Um, but yes, I mean, the, the officially sanctioned media, in a sense, has always been uh, a place where uh, these sort of uh, behind-the-scenes debates have taken place. And uh, as I say, it's very difficult often to make sense of newspapers, uh, of the language in the newspapers, the content of the newspapers, unless you are there. And you have some knowledge of the rumor mill itself, what's going on in the country, who has a rivalry with whom among the elites, in order to understand what the newspapers are saying at some level. And so um, I think that there is a sort of long, uh, uh, this is part of a longer process, but in, in some sense, in recent decades, the internet has made this easier as well, made this, these sort of in, intra-elite rivalries easier uh, and uh, rumors among, uh, circulated among elites easier to do. It's funny when it boils over, like with the Larajani brothers and that whole recent debate, you know, the, in, in, in Parliament, and then right. it ends up in the New York Times, right. and it's, no one understands it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The yeah. Western audiences cannot un unpack all of that because right. it's the culmination of like years worth of rumors and, and backfighting and you know, it's just right. I mean, you, you, you need you need like, like a fifteen page booklet yeah, basically to understand, to understand the, the article. Yeah. Uh, and so, but I mean, again, it it, it shows that uh, uh, how complicated all of this is, how complicated the political situation in Iran is. I mean, the idea of Iran as an authoritarian state is ludicrous. I mean, it's a, it's a place with multiple, it has been a, 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 a since the Islamic Revolution is, is uh, characterized by multiple centers of power, and always has been. Um, and so, uh, and, and these folks are constantly jostling amongst each other to make sure that uh, one doesn't get the advantage over the other, in a sense. And so, um, and, and the rumor mill has been a big part of this, a big part of undercutting one another as well, I think. Yeah. Um. I'm, I'm trying to you know, get the things that you said in a frame of the social movement and the framing processes. And then, uh, do you think that it is mostly the rumors are having an embedded agenda from the elite to create a sort of shared understanding or achieving a type of a, creating a shared frame or picture um, as the case of Cinema Rex or the Tahdi? And recently, Samad Behrang is dead. That right. turned out to be Actually, someone claims that he saw that Samad was drawn in the river. Right. But the two, the party decided to show you that Sawa killed him. Mm -hmm. So do you think it is actually, these are, there has it some sort of directionality from the elites, political elites, and they are not like bottom-up rumors that mm -hmm. are that the people do like a collective sense-making and forming a rumor and then get spread? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's a little bit of both, uh, in a sense, going on. Uh, I mean, that's the problem with rumor is how can you trace it? Where does it start? But I certainly think that elites, once a rumor does start, can get behind it and can put their own spin on it. And maybe they are the root, the source of it. But again, part of the problem here is that, you know, how can we, how can we say who's the author of this particular rumor? Uh, that's what makes it a rumor, is that we can't. Uh, in a sense, trace it back to any one group or to, to the elites or to the... To the agendas are post hoc. I think so. Yeah, that. I mean, you, you have an event that happens and then you have various interpretations of that particular event. And I think, as, as, I, as I'm trying to say, uh, you know, we don't just report on the news. We are always making the news, in a sense. And rumors are just as legitimate a form of news making, uh, to my way of thinking, as a, uh, you know, the, the article of a pro professional journalist with sources and so on. I mean, they're both, in a sense, doing the same thing. Yes. Uh, are there any uh, specific measures of censorship or uh, laws and regulations to govern or pu punish the rumor in Iran? 
Uh, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, sometimes newspapers are closed down because of their reporting of a news of a particular rumor. I mean, that's happened a lot over the past hundred years. Well, I, I mean, yeah. There, there's a there's a, there's a dense, uh, you know, a, a, a huge, extensive press law that's press been uh, that's been uh, written and rewritten multiple times over the past hundred years, and no one can publish a paper in Iran without an official license from the government. And the moment that you, uh, uh, you know, uh, violate that license, then you can no longer publish. And as I say, this has happened uh, on numerous occasions over the past 100 years. And, and, and how about things in the Europe and in the US, if you happen to know? Mm -hmm. Because I know that uh, freedom of expression is mm -hmm. very popular and strongly protected here. So, right. so how to balance the two? Well, well yeah, I mean, I, I suppose that's a good question. I mean, here you would imagine that uh, because of freedom of expression, it's a rumor free for all, in a sense. Um, and it is at some level. I mean, maybe uh, uh, going back to your question, maybe that's the difference that we can, we can draw between the two. Uh, uh, between rumor uh, in Iran and rumor in the Western world. Um, I mean, the, the circumstances are different, but both allow for the, the playing out and operation of rumors, in a sense, nevertheless. Yeah, I'm sorry. No. The, the, it's interesting to say that you can both be shut down for publishing rumor, but publishing rumor is a way of getting around being shut down for publishing the truth. Exactly. So it's, exactly. So right. it's enforced, you know. Inconsistently, yeah. Basically, whatever somebody doesn't like at right. that point in time, depending on who's at work that day, that newspaper can get in trouble. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that, that's that's a very good point. Is that I, I mean, some of these newspapers, uh, in order to have a paper, you need to be able to report on something, and oblique reference to these rumors allows for you to import uh, report on important matters of the day. Uh, in a sense, but you have to do it very carefully. Otherwise, you know, it's all over for you, uh, as, as far as they're concerned. Yes. Um, two questions. Um, one is related to discussions here. Um, it's about uh, how how concerned uh, is the uh, Iranian regime with uh, internet rumors? Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, uh, um, internet and rumors in the media. Mm -hmm. uh, I ask this question because um, Chinese regime. Um, is very concerned about internet rumors. So there are a lot of uh, um, well, things being done. Right. And this is more general questions. Well, the more specific question is about the cases you presented, the, this case of um, of a mysterious death, and then the earlier case of the 1978 fire right. rumor. It seems to me that they are very different. Mm -hmm. There are two different kinds of rumors. Uh, in the earlier case, 78, as you said, it seems to be um, crucial in terms of, uh, you know, after that, the revolution was on. Mm -hmm. So it, in a sense, you could say it triggered a sequence of right. a very important se um, political sequence. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's more like the afterlife mm -hmm. of a um, what, rumor or incident. Mm -hmm. um, so. No, I, I wonder wh whether you would make this kind of distinction and uh, mm. how that would help us understand um, more specifically about rumor as political right. communication. The earlier case, I thought, is obviously more political in the sense of its relation, its impact on the revolutionary movement. Right. No, I, I, that, that's a very good question. I mean, one thing that remains to be done here is further conceptualization of rumor itself as, as political uh, communication. And I, that's not to say that the, the, the mysterious death of Tahdi wasn't itself, uh, didn't itself have some political consequences. It did, I suppose, uh, because it was seen to be just one more um, uh, action on the part of the Shah's regime to uh, uh, eliminate anyone who was seen even to be um, uh, indirectly in opposition to it. And <clears throat> again, I mean, the, the death of Samad Behrangi, the author Samad Behrangi, at around the same time is seen in much the same light. And again, it's, that's another event that's talked about down to the present day as well. 
Uh, and so these, these events are, uh, do taint the Shah's regime and do contribute to the revolution, but not in the same immediate way, certainly, uh, as the, the Cinema Rex fire does. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's something that I, I, I would need, I think I need to sit down and think about, the difference between the two, because I think you're right. There is, a, there is definitely a difference between the two, and a difference between the kinds of consequences they have, short term and long term. Um, and as, as far as internet rumors, how uh, the government handles them, well, I mean, Twitter is banned in Iran, for example. I mean, there are lots of ways around it, just as there are, I'm sure, in China uh, for, for people that are on Twitter. Um, Facebook, too, is highly limited, uh, although very recently, I think Khamenei himself, the supreme leader, set up his own Facebook. So uh, there, are, there are lots of um, uh, contradictions there as well. Um, they want to use these social media themselves, but they want to also control the use of these particular social media. Um, but yeah, I mean, as I say, it, it's very hard to clamp down on rumor. The problem with rumor is that it's everywhere. And uh, you can't trace it to anybody. And as I say, I think the most important source of rumor in Iran is the cell phone. I mean, today, uh, cell phone saturation is higher than it is in this country. I think it's about 110 percent, and here it's about 80 something percent, I believe. Uh, so there's uh, <clears throat> and the cell phones are crucial, and uh, uh, texting. I mean, everybody is constantly texting, and you get co you get these texts too. You uh, there are chain texts that are sent to people that have, you know, uh, that, uh, broadcast rumor in these ways as well. And uh, their trustworthiness, in a sense, is connected often to where they come from, who sent them, who can vouch for them. There has to be somebody that you know, in a sense, that will vouch for them. Uh, and so that, I think that's also crucial uh, here, too. I mean, there's lots of rumors out there. Uh, but the difference between people believing in those rumors and the difference between people believing that those rumors are simply misinformation uh, is, is something that uh, is dependent on who is telling you, who is giving that, conveying that particular, communicating that particular rumor to you. Yeah. So do you think that there is a particular like Persian culture affinity for the conspiracy theory? Well, I think that there is, I don't want to say that because obviously that's what some people have argued. But at the same time, uh, people believe in conspiracies because they're true, because they've actually happened in, in Iran. Well, how much do you so I mean, the, 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 the Mossadegh coup was a conspiracy. Yeah. You know? Is that, is that the, like the primal scream for that in Iran? Is that like no. the definitive thing that happened and post that everything can be a conspiracy because at one time it was. No, no, because... Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the first Russian wars. Right. Right. You know, right. Even, you know, the Brits, they, they betrayed them in those wars. Exactly. And they sent them for the yeah. second round of wars that they lost badly because yeah. they, we were, you know, they support. I mean, and then the France did the same thing. You know, the Napoleon did this. Right. And it keeps mm -hmm. going. I mean, yeah. in, in 86, even yeah. Afghanistan gets yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I, I think if, if, if we can Actually, talk about last two hundred years, yeah, if, if we can talk about one stable element of Iranian nationalism, it's this: it's anti-imperialism by and large. That's the the, the, the major characteristic of Iranian na nationalism, and anti-imperialism because of foreign intervention in Iranian affairs, and that's not because of one event. Although obviously the Mossadegh event is the most prominent event in the minds of many Iranians, uh, of uh, uh, a prominent example of uh, foreign intervention in Iran. Uh, but no, I mean, uh, people believe in conspiracies because we've been the victim of them, in a sense. And so th that's why they're there. But uh, I mean, there are, I, I, you could say that there are also some historical roots here, too. Uh, I mean, courtly intrigue uh, has been a big part of elite politics for a long time. And that often involved a conspiracy of some sort. Uh, and, uh, you know, Iranians in general have a very good understanding of and appreciation for their history. Uh, it, it, it's a big part of how they think about the world itself. Uh, and most people in Iran at some level are also, uh, you know, uh, uh, modernity in Iran is in, at some level, I would, uh, I would argue, the democratization of courtly practices too. So uh, 
I think that there is something there. There is something historically rooted there too. But I wouldn't go so far to say that it's you know part of the innate characteristic of all Iranians to believe in, in rumors uh, and conspiracies that the world is governed by them or orchestrated by them. I don't know if I answered your question. Comparative stuff would be interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, again, I, I don't think Iran is, uh, is unusual here either. Uh, again, the people that have talked about uh, the minds of uh, Middle Easterners being played by conspiracy aren't just talking about Iran. They bring up examples from the entire region, obviously. And uh, one of the reasons is because foreign intervention is not something that's unique to Iran either yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting in the region. Look at this kind of thing in Afghanistan or something. Or, I mean, I think it takes a political, historical, and then modern, right. like legal, journalistic kind of apparatus yeah. that is their code. They're, they're comorbid, basically. They're like coterminous, yeah. existing to kind of produce this vibrant, you know, rumor mill in Iran right. in a way that has a real political import. Yeah, absolutely. not It's not meaningless. It doesn't no. just exist, you know, oh, it's the rumor mill, but it actually right. is making, it's it's a political function in some way. Right, right. That, I mean, that's it's, very, very market in Iran, where I, I don't know of any other yeah. examples I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's not just idle chatter, that's for sure. I mean, some of it is, certainly. And some of it is, uh, is just there for prurient interests, right. really. I mean, a lot of the rumors about uh, the Ayatollah's private lives, for example, is just for prurient interest, by and large. And you hear this a lot. I mean, the same people that give you the, the rumors of political import are also giving you these rumors, too. I mean, again, taxi drivers are perhaps the best source for, for some of this information. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, uh, where else I I we see this uh, is a good question and something that I would I would need to, to look into. Certainly. Conspiracy theory, Jack Straw, the former prime uh, foreign minister in the British government, he wrote his memoir recently, and I think the fifth chapter is on Iran, and he said that in eyes of Iranians, we are still a poor superpower, and we, you know, all British politicians like it. And then said that because all Iranians believe that behind everything is a bridge. Right. And at, and at the end of the sentence, said, actually, we did a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is, especially among a certain generation, there's a real feeling that the, 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 the British are the real villains in modern Iranian history. I mean, there's, a, there's an old joke about Khomeini that if you lift up his beard, you're going to see the Union Jack. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, there's... there's uh, that's that's seemingly always always been there. Thank you. Oh, thank you for having me.